Howdy there folks, welcome into today's video. We got a busy video here today and man, is it gonna be an epic week in the market and you know, the reason I just showed you that picture, I'll get to that in just a moment, is not to remind you of all the food you ate last week nonetheless, uh, and I'll explain that in just a moment, but it's a very important week actually in the market with some extremely important companies that are about to make some pretty big moves here. And so I wanna take you through everything that's transpiring this week and kind of show you all those uh, various things that are going on out there. Also, I wanted to say, you know, somebody saw me at a restaurant, said hello, yesterday for everybody that ever sees me in real life and, and says hi i appreciate y'all and and always thanks for showing love and those sorts of things I, and also for all the people that dm me bro i'm coming to vegas let's go to the win let's go top golf let's do this do that I, I never can do that sorts of stuff, okay? So I apologize. Uh, if you didn't know, I live a slightly busy life with three kids and a wife and uh, obviously the YouTube channel, right? And then uh, obviously constantly researching companies, running the private stock group, all those sorts of things. So yeah, my life is slightly busy. So I usually can't uh, do all that fun stuff that you guys do, but I'm glad everybody has fun when they come to the city, man. It's a fun place nonetheless, okay? So let's get into this. Hope you guys enjoyed it as always. Thank you everybody that subscribed to the channel and uh, comes for the videos every single day. So first off here, the reason I got this picture up here is, once again, not to remind you how much food you ate last week, but last week, nonetheless, is almost like an off week for the stock market. It's just the way it is. Thanksgiving week, a lot of the fund managers, a lot of the high net worth individuals, it, they just kind of go sleepy mode in <laughs> Thanksgiving week. And it's one of the most boring weeks usually in the stock market, which is exactly what we saw last week. You saw volumes dry up on stocks. The market's closed on Thursday. On Friday, it's a half a day. So nonetheless, in, in, in prior to that, a lot of people are already traveling. They're just already out of New York City. They're just like, don't even care. Don't even care about like whatever's going on in the market. It's just the way it is. And so nonetheless, when you get into this week, what you're gonna see is like this pent up demand for trading activity and folks wanting to like get out there and make moves. And, and like, I don't know, it's just the way it is. And, and so you gotta understand like, this is the week we just had is one of the sleepiest weeks in the market. The other sleepiest week you usually get in the market is Christmas week. And especially if it's like, um, let's call it like Christmas in, is in the middle of the week. So let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that's when it's really like just a sleepy, sleepy week in the market nonetheless. Okay. Now I wanted to just start by showing you guys essentially where the markets have gone over the past year. So the NASDAQ's down about 27 and a half percent the past one year. Russell's down 16.7% the past one year and the S and P 500 is down 12% the past one year. Now, if you notice very recently, obviously the market has started to bounce back. Almost all the indexes reached lows at some point in October. Some of them, it was early October. Some of them, it was more toward like mid-October. Even the end of September a little bit for some of these indexes in terms of their biggest lows they've reached this in entire year. And the VIX has completely died. It's, it's like completely died on us, essentially. And it's gotten all the way back to levels we were at pretty much back in like when the market was just kind of making its pump move, uh, which was all the way into the beginning of August. And then basically after that, what happened was the market started to tank, VIX started to spike higher. And ever since the VIX peaked, like literally this, like pretty much two days after the VIX peaked, the market started going up again. And so nonetheless, it's like VIX down, market up, <laughs> VIX up, market down. It, it's it's the way it's kind of been here recently. In the dollar index as well, which I know we don't talk too much about the dollar because usually it's not of massive importance in terms of the, the markets in general, but this year has been different. The dollar has honestly dictated almost where stocks have gone this entire year. And it is never more apparent than the past month in the market. And if you go ahead and you look, look what's happened since the dollar started to finally break down and go down. And look what's happened to the NASDAQ. I got the cues up here. Look what's happened to the NASDAQ in that same amount of time. And in 2022, it's been as simple as dollar down, stocks up. Dollar up, stocks down. It's the way it's been this year. It's not always like that, but it is the way it's been this year. And um, as the dollar's just kind of roared, growth stocks and a lot of stocks in general have just faltered. And do keep in mind, the dollar definitely hurts a lot of companies that do international business, which, to be quite frank, is almost all the biggest companies in the world. It's not like they're just U.S. companies; they're they're, they're global companies. Okay. Now, Tuesday after the bell. Very important company report earnings. That's not because it's a $110 billion market cap, although that's a massive market cap and it's important. Intuit. So if you don't know Intuit, this is a company that's border, and by the way, the stock's been hit heavily the past one year. It's down about over 41%. Intuit's a borderline 
necessity company for small businesses inside the United States of America. I mean, if you're a small, if you run a small business, you almost, um, I almost 100% guarantee you even you either thought about using at least one of Intuit's products or you actually use them, okay? Bottom line, QuickBooks, TurboTax, all their different products out there are massive with small businesses. And so if you want to talk about the, the worries about recession, what's going to happen to the economy in 2023, those sorts of things, if you want to you want to understand where small business is at, where they're spending, not spending, things like that, and two, it's a very good company to understand that. How many new clients are they adding, right? Because if they're not adding very many new clients, a company like Intuit, that can be a, a pretty... In, pretty interesting sign that maybe not a lot of new new businesses are formating right uh so which is which also kind of shows you like the state of the economy if not a lot of people are starting new businesses that can mean there's not as many people optimistic out there right and it's more like let me just try to find a job rather than start a business in just like a risk adverse situation because let's be honest starting a small business is taking a risk right and so we, if we look and i don't know how much you guys um you know keep up to date with these sorts of things but i think it is important to understand the state of the economy if you look at the small business Business optimism index it declined another 0.8 points in October to 91.3 uh, 91.3 which is a tenth consecutive month below the 49 year average of 98. 33% of owners reported that inflation was their single highest important subject, which obviously, you know, I think that comes as no surprise for us, right? Owners continue to show a dismal view about future sales growth and business conditions, but are still looking to hire new workers. So, I mean, that just doesn't even go together. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it just shows you how crazy 2022 has been that you have, you know, them showing dismal, dismal sales growth expectations, business conditions, but are still looking to hire. It's just like, it's mind blowing, it, but that's 2022 for you. So nonetheless, guys, Intuit, I think is a very good insight to small business and how small business is doing or not doing out there. Now, this chart's very important. This is small business optimism index. I mean, it shows you basically over the past 10 plus years, right? all the way back to 2011. And the way to think about this is when you're dipping below 90, basically small businesses are not fe feeling very good at all. And I'm, you know, if you go back to obviously the great financial crisis, we are way, way massively down. And if you're above, if you're in the kind of the 90, the 100 range, you're kind of in more normalish range. When you're over 100, that means small businesses are feeling great. They're very optimistic about the futures of their small businesses, okay? You know, something's very interesting about this. When I looked at this chart earlier today, which I don't usually look at this whole chart, I just kind of keep a track of the numbers over time, but something very interesting happened here, okay? Look at the way this chart shot up toward the end of 2016. Now, what happened at the end of 2016, okay? Well, obviously, that's when it was announced uh, Trump was going to be the next president, right? So, you know, you, you could be very negative on, on Trump or positive or whatever, right? And some people are kind of like me and they're indifferent, right? And they see his flaws and they see the things he also did well. But at the end of the day, one thing that I don't think you could debate about Trump is that man gave small businesses confidence for whatever reason, for whatever reason, maybe it's because he was a businessman and he was getting in office. I don't know, okay? But the bottom line is, from the moment it was announced he was going to be the next president, small business optimism went to the moon, okay? People got very excited about the future. And it basically stayed there through almost his entire presidency, right? And even in Rona, it still stayed relatively high, even obviously when in a kind of a devastating situation for a lot of small businesses. And then once, obviously, it was announced that he was going bye-bye, small business confidence started to fall almost immediately. And then as inflation hit big time, obviously we've seen what's happened with the numbers here. And so this is very interesting and very telling. You can see this in the chart over time on you know where, where small businesses were actually feeling very, very optimistic and excited about the future and where they're just feeling very dismal and just feeling bad about the future of uh, the economy and, and, and their small businesses in general, right? And, and at the end of the day, you know, small business is still what runs the United States of America. I always say, at the end of the day, middle class runs the United States of America. Small business runs the United States of America. Big corporations can only thrive because the middle class is thriving. If the middle class is not thriving, big corporations get hurt. Small businesses are what dictates how big businesses do, right? Look at a company like Intuit. 
The reason Intuit is a $100 billion plus dollar market cap company is not because of large corporations. It's because of small businesses and mid-sized businesses across the United States of America. That's why that company is so big. And so at the end of the day, middle class, small businesses, they're what dictates this whole game. And if they're not feeling good, and if they're showing a lot of pessimism moving forward, it's a very troubling sign. And especially if it's like a continue, it's one thing if it's like one month or two months, but when you're seeing a consistent downtrend of optimism, that it's a very telling sign about where the state of the economy can be and where it's going. Because I'm telling you, the middle class runs the whole show and small businesses run the whole show. Okay. It's always, it's always been. And, and despite, you know, the death of small businesses and middle class at the end of the day, it's still the, the, the truth. It's still the truth, man. Cyber Monday sales are also going to come out Tuesday. Now, from what we've seen, Black Friday sales numbers were actually surprisingly impressive. Surprisingly impressive. Now, when it comes to Cyber Monday, the important thing to remember is Cyber Monday very heavy electronics products. That's the way it's always been when it comes to Cyber Monday. Black Friday is almost more like everything. Cyber Monday is very heavy electronics products. That's what it's always kind of, you know, everybody's thought about, okay, Cyber Monday, that's when I buy a new computer or buy a new headphones or whatever it is, right? And so nonetheless, those numbers will be important. Those will move, move stocks like Best Buy. Those will move stocks even maybe like a Costco a little bit. Those will move stocks like probably Corsair Gaming, which is a stock I own, CRSR, maybe even Activision Blizzards and, and many other stocks, okay? So Cyber Monday, Tuesday sales uh, will, will, is when when those sales numbers will come out. Okay. Wednesday after the bell is an important one for any Palantir shareholders watching this uh, video right now, which I'm now a new fresh uh, Palantir shareholder as of uh, a few months ago in snowflakes reporting Wednesday after the bell, which, you know, a lot of people try to put snowflake and Palantir as like competitors, which they compete a little bit, definitely um, not across every product category, but they definitely at least compete a little bit. And both these stocks have been hit almost equally this year. Snowflake's down 60%, Palantir's down 65%. They've both gotten absolutely obliterated. And the interesting thing with Snowflake is, not just that it still trades at obviously a very high valuation, even though it's come down immensely, right? 60% down, but the companies expect to have 61% revenue growth and, and, you know, for this quarter they're about to announce on Wednesday, and then another 53% growth. Now, that is a pretty big de deceleration, and keep in mind, current year's at 70% revenue growth. So now, if you're talking about by January quarter year 53, it's a massive kind of deceleration of growth. But nonetheless, if they can, if they can meet these numbers and beat these numbers, I will say, not, and I'm not a Snowflake shareholder, but I'll say that's damn impressive. Because I can tell you, in this environment, there's not many companies growing their revenue 60, 50, 60%. It's incredibly impressive numbers. If Snowflake can still grow like that in this current economic environment, I'll be very, very impressed by Snowflake. And if they, if they beat those numbers, don't be surprised if Snowflake stock flies. And don't be surprised if it pulls Palantir a little bit with it. Snowflake and Palantir are going to trade more and more together over the next five years, in my opinion. There's, you know, either Palantir will outperform Snowflake or vice versa. But believe me, those stocks will start to trade together more and more. I think it's already started. And that's why you see those stock prices. One is down 60%, the other is down 65%. So don't be surprised if, if when Snowflake makes a big upward move, it pulls Palantir. If Palantir makes a big upward move, it pulls Snowflake and vice versa over in the future. So just keep an eye on that. Don't be surprised at all. And honestly, if I was a... As a shareholder, you should almost be rooting for both companies. You really should. Uh, you know, even if you're only a shareholder of one, root for both of them. I'll say that, okay? Salesforce, they're reporting Wednesday after the bell. This is a massive market cap company, $150 billion market cap on this one. And uh, this is an interesting stock. So first off, you see their P ratio 294. That's because of some one-time costs. And their, their, their forward P is at like a 27, something like that, 27, 28. So it's not crazy like it looks there okay now the stock has gone down almost it's almost been cut in half from its 52 week high of around 300 dollars a share nonetheless and so it has been hit in a major way and when it comes to salesforce this has been one of the most important stocks of the let's call it 2009 through 2021 rally of the market right 14 years ago this was a seven dollar stock and as the economy got healthier and healthier over the years, and as business grew bigger and bigger, and companies had more and more success, I felt like Salesforce was always one of the most telling companies. Never stock I personally owned, but I wish I owned it over all this time. It's done tremendous, right? But it was always one of those stocks that kind of, it was almost like emblematic of 
the market we've been in over the years, right? And it's kind of felt like a, I don't want to say a popping of the bubble, but like a deflation of the whole market, right? In the economy and in the stocks that used to be the ones that led us up to the moon are now the ones that are leading us down to the floor, essentially, right? And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, this has just been an incredible stock. I mean, 14 years to be, 14 years ago, this was a $7 stock. Even though the stock's down massively, almost 50% from its 52 week high, it's still, you know, $150 stock. I mean, it's incredible, incredible gains for the stock over the years. Absolutely phenomenal company. I just actually added this one to my big tech because sometimes we forget about this one. But CRM, this company will move the indexes the, the next day, essentially. So they're going to report after the bell, but they'll move the whole, the whole indexes the next day. If they have anything really bad to say or really good to say, they'll move the entire indexes because it's that big of a market cap. And I'm telling you, everybody who's everybody in the stock market pays attention to Salesforce. Every single fund manager out there, even if they don't own it, they keep an eye on it. They keep an eye on their earnings, their guidance, all those sorts of things. It's a very important stock. And the only run of it I ever had with Salesforce was when they bought a stock I owned, which was called Slack, and they paid about $27.7 billion for that deal. And I do wonder how that integration has been going. I, I, I don't know. I haven't kept up with it enough, but I do wonder how that whole integration went uh, nonetheless. Okay? Victoria Seekers reporting Wednesday after the bell. Now, this is important stock to understand like because what we're going to likely hear out of Victoria's Secret is not just the numbers from their past quarter, but believe me, if they have any good numbers to report from what happened on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, they will let those numbers out and they're going to say, hey, you know, we reported dot, dot, dot number on Black Friday sales and this number on, on Cyber Monday sales. Those are, if they're good, they'll release it because at the end of the day, that's what management teams do. If something's really, really good, they're going to let you know about it. And they're going to say, we had a record or we had the best year in years for Black Friday. So now if they don't say that, that may be a little troubling. Like, Ooh, why are they not going to say it? And if they don't release anything, Believe me, on the conference calls, analysts will ask questions. So if you want to get even a, a more in-depth look at Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and how that's doing, definitely look at VS's numbers because at the end of the day, VS is definitely one of those companies that benefits in a massive way from shoppers being out there, malls being full, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. It's one of those most directly correlated stocks. And if you didn't know, they used to be part of L Brands, um, good old LB, which they they used to own uh, obviously Victoria's Secret and then they own Bath and Body Works plus a bunch of smaller brands as well and uh, Pink and all those sorts of things and now Pink's over here but uh, nonetheless Bath and Body Works used to be kind of the star and you, VS used to be the one that held down the whole show and like you would just perform horrible but Bath and Body Works would do great and so now they're split up in Bath and Body Works as its own company which by the way Bath and Body Works was stupid busy when I went to the mall on Black Friday I couldn't even believe how busy it was I was like I thought they were giving out free shares of Bath and Body Works talking it was absolutely ridiculous. And by the way, Bath and Body Works, don't shop there. Shop, shop at Sparta Candles, okay, in, in soaps, because that's a real place. I don't know if you guys know, um, but I actually put this out in the, the private stock group. And um, inspirational message. I think everybody needs to hear a little something a little inspiring this year. This is Sparta Candles. The company was started by someone in the private stock group a few years ago. Her business has gone insane. They make soaps and candles. Uh, she used to be a realtor and stock market investor. And uh, now she's built this incredible business, incredible business. And uh, I said, the moral of the story is you'd be amazed how much your life can change in a three to five year span, like night and day. Always stay positive, always stay putting in the work because I mean, you know, it's been fun to just watch her. You know, she was a member of the private stock group and she's just blown up this business and doing incredible sales numbers. And oh my gosh, their products are absolutely amazing. So I just want to give her a shout out. And uh, she sent me a box, this box of soaps. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. It smells so good. So yeah, moral of the story. Stay positive, stay put in the work. Don't shop at Bath and Body Works, shop at the Sparta, man, because they make way better products just straight up. Like, it's not even close. Kroger. So they're reporting Thursday before the bell. Now, you might wonder why I got a laughing face here, because Kroger right now, this is like basically another way of getting an inflation report out. All they're going to ask on the conference call, they, no one even cares about how Kroger is actually running their business, which Kroger is one of the biggest grocery store chains in the United States. They are the biggest grocery store chain in the United States of America. They own almost all the biggest brands out there that are grocery stores inside the United States of America. And everybody's going to be asking about how the consumer is doing, what trends they're seeing as far as inflation. Are they seeing any deflation on products and all those sorts of things? That's what everybody's going to want to talk about. And you're going to get question after question. And so if you want to more a better version of an inflation report listen to the kroger conference call listen to the kroger conference call and i'm telling you you can find that on their investor relations page for anybody that doesn't know 
you will end up having a deeper understanding of what's actually going on with inflation than the the government inflation reports that all lag in a massive massive way because it gets no more it gets no more nitty gritty than a company that a ton of their food stores also sell uh, gasoline as well. Um, it gets no more nitty gritty in understanding of the level of detail than a Kroger conference call in terms of understanding inflation and what's going on there. Okay, Ulta Beauty is reporting Thursday after the bell. No. Ulta's actually, I think, I think they're one of the most impressive retailers in the world, bar none. And look at this stock. This is incredible. This stock is, it was $5 back in 2009. $5. Today, this stock is $448 per share. One of the most insane turnarounds you'll ever see. This business was in a very bad place in 2009. Very bad place. And um, to see the way they turned around this company over the years and created this into a beast has been nothing short of extraordinary to see play out. I mean, absolutely one of the most impressive turns you will ever see for a company in your entire life. Absolutely amazing. I mean, it's nearly 100x stock. Nearly 100x stock. For the most, I mean, this is one of the most simple business models. Obviously, they sell products online as well. But at the end of the day, it's a cosmetics and beauty store. And, and they just absolutely tear it up and they've done just the best job. The best job you can ever imagine for a turnaround. Like if you ever want to pay attention to a turnaround story and how they did it, pay attention to what happened with Ulta Beauty. It goes way under the radar, but I'm telling you, it's it's absolutely amazing. And it brings it brings me to a video I put out a few days ago. On my new channel, Jeremy LeFay Makes Money, my reaction channel, where I reacted to a JC video that was talking about how Texas Roadhouse has outperformed Google stock over the past 10 years. And sometimes you see these sorts of things and you think like the only way you can get great returns in the stock market is if you're in some super risky stocks or something like that or or like, you know, some... You might think, oh, I need to own some super risky stock or some like tech stock or something like that. Um, but what you're going to find over time is some of the best performing stocks in the world or actually some of the most simple business models out there. And, you know, when you look at a stock like Ulta, I mean, that's not like it's some super complicated business model or some tech company, and yet it's almost wrecked every single tech company out there over the past, you know, 10, 12, 15 years. Like pull up Ulta and pull up Apple. Pull up Ulta and pull up Meta. Pull up Ulta and pull up Google. And, you know, just go through all the different tech companies. And there you are with a stock that's just about wrecked them all, to be quite frank from a, such a simple business model. And the Texas Roadhouse versus Google stock example is another incredible, it's like a steakhouse, a steakhouse beats out a tech giant. And you look at my second best investment, my second best investment in of the past, you know, let's call it three or four years is Elf Cosmetics, a cosmetics and beauty company. Like such a simple business model. And yet it's performed so amazing. So sometimes some of the best performing stocks out there can come from these uh, places of it's not super complicated. One of my greatest stocks ever used to be a company named Cabela's, which was this massive like hunting stores and and camping stores and those sorts of things and fishing and all that stuff. Right. Um, another one of my great stocks back in the day was Monster Energy, a, a company that was used to be called Hanson's Natural Beverage back in the day. So, you know, they sold energy drinks. It's like sometimes some of the best performing stocks you'll ever find or some of the most simple business models. And sometimes these big giant tech companies or even like growing tech companies, sometimes they're not what they're cracked up to be in certain situations, right? It doesn't mean you can't still get gains, but sometimes they'll get wrecked by other companies because a lot of times at the end of the day, these tech companies have to pay ridiculous salaries. Like, you know, uh, 150,000 of, you know, 450,000 for an average employee, an average employee at some of these companies. And they have to give all the stock-based compensation, which obviously dilutes shareholder value in a massive way. So, yeah, sometimes you can get some of the best gainers from such of the, the most simple business models out there. And uh, I just always want you guys to always remember that. And uh, also, in regards to Ulta, Honest just got a big partnership with them here very recently. Um, so I'm very excited to see where that goes over time. That's a huge deal, man. Um, you know. I mean, there's a reason Alt is a $22 billion company. And there's a reason you want to release a press release when you do something with Alta because that's massive. So I'm really excited to see where that goes in the future. And if you're looking for some entertainment this week, especially on Thursday after the bell, Thursday afternoon, you know, don't worry about watching the World Cup on Fubo. Don't worry about, you know, the Thursday night football game on wherever the crap they put those games nowadays, which we can't even find those anymore, okay? Watch a sauna stock. 
after the bell on Thursday and get ready for a wild move. I've watched that one make so many crazy moves. And now that I'm pointing it out, I'll probably move like 2% after hours that day now. But uh, I've watched that stock make ridiculous moves, like, you know, 20, 30, 40% type moves. And so don't be surprised if that one is just ridiculously volatile after the after they report earnings and going into friday that should be a entertainment type stock hope you guys enjoyed today's video as always uh right now we got the black f or we got the cyber monday sale going on for the private stock group so if you're looking to take advantage of that cyber monday sale check out the pinned comment down there and uh, access that before it ends at uh it should end at midnight on cyber monday so appreciate y'all joining me as always much love and have a great day